Okay, we're here to talk about, or, you know, at least show a sneak peek of something new that uh, the Module Federation group has been working on. Um, this is Tyson, and Tyson's been working really closely with us on pretty much pioneering back-end federated architecture. And, um, yeah, I think that's, you know, enough of a good introduction into what we're going to see. Um, Tyson, why don't you introduce yourself and just, you know, kick it off. Take us through what is Aegis, what is Microlib, um, why should we care? Right, so uh, I was thinking about, you know, what are the major problems with, you know, cloud native architecture microservices, right? And it's um, it's gotten a lot of traction. A lot of people have tried to adopt it and a lot of people have failed. Um, and the reason for that, <clears throat> um, you know, is kind of surprising or rather not surprising and it seems that there's a solution to it, right? That's um, that's been maybe overlooked, but certainly has been enabled by the work that's been done on Federation. Um, particularly, you know, Webpack is well placed with code splitting, right? Um, dependency graphs and then code streaming. Um, you know, zero install, right? Basically, we remove the uh, need to install software on the server. So uh, what do you mean uh, that we remove the need to install software on the server? Because this zero install is a kind of new phrase that we've been using, but what does zero install truly mean for, for the layman out there? Right. So that means that we're going to, uh, we're going to stream the code uh, as we need it, right? As we, as we're, as we execute, um, we'll, we'll grab the code from wherever, um, we're for for uh, a demo coming up. We're going to actually just grab it right off GitHub. So um, you're having the server read its own code, or this monolith read its own code, and the hosting source is the remote's GitHub, and you just read it right from GitHub, and it runs as a single process over HTTP, kind of like how the browser would work if you were embedding scripts right. directly from GitHub. Yep, exactly. Uh, so so that's that's a good analogy. Exactly. Um, so what's what's uh, what this helps us solve is um, it basically we get rid of what's called the microservices premium, which is the fact that um, distributed apps are really hard, and microservices are nothing but a distributed application. And the reason that they're distributed is so that they have we have deployment independence, and we can have different teams work on their their uh, service or services. Right and more or less independently, they don't have to check in with the other teams when they're going to deploy, because the deployment is isolated. It has it's not going to have an impact on other services. That's the idea. But that what that leads to is uh, you may be seeing pictures of um, like the Death Star effect, right? Where you've got all these microservices all over the place, and their their interconnections are so complex that it leads to operational complexity that. Um, basically makes them unmanageable uh, after a while. And then you need to get things in like Istio to figure out, okay, well, who's talking to what? And you need to get uh, mesh in there uh, you know, to figure out this, this so basically. Mesh, yeah, all of these. Yeah, this, it, there's a lot of operational costs to that, that you don't really see immediately when you're talking about scaling microservice architecture. Exactly. And uh, and not to mention, it's just it's difficult to develop, right? Um, it's just hard. Every to company builds some flavor of something that's internal, you know. Even like Terraform, it's a great abstraction, but every company still has to write a massive amount of Terraform scripts to handle their deploy. Yes, that's like you know one of the best abstractions that we've got, but it's still not a cookie cutter that's solution tough. to a cookie cutter problem. Yeah, so communicating, you know, having a bunch of you know standalone executables. Talking uh, to talking to each other over the network, you know, that's just uh, intrinsically more difficult than uh, through memory calls, uh, you know, function calls in memory. Um, also, sounds less stable because if the network is the least stable less, part, less then, performant, yeah, less stable, for sure. And my microservices, by calling other microservices, this architecture, you kind of get a tax almost on latency. Uh, TCP or UDP, there's still some overhead and the serialization and unserialization as you pass it through different, you know, lambdas or something like that. But so, as you're saying in memory, like if, so, if something was in memory, you're, we're talking a nanosecond 
maybe two. And we're talking, uh, you know, uh, not not the unreliability of uh, you know aspects of the network. Um, yeah, and, that's and true. So and, and memory is like the most. It's probably even more stable than on disk because <laughs> it's already loaded in. Memory, memory is cheap, right? Um, so let's use it. So if we're using all this in memory, it sounds like this solution could be memory heavy. Is it memory heavy, or is it actually quite light on memory? comparatively like if we say a lambda has say 500 megs of ram how concerned should i be implementing like small to medium sized application well that's uh, that all depends on your deployment and uh composability right is is part of uh the design right so that you have the flexibility uh to co-locate services together in the same process running together in the same process or uh you know um remotely so when you when you look at this network aspect, you start to con, start to ask yourself, well, can I get uh, uh, can I preserve deployment independence, but get rid of the uh, uh, the need for for distribution, or for for so much distribution, so I can have my teams remain independent, um, they can deploy as they like, but <clears throat> the the services are going to run as libraries, right? Um, and uh, you you often hear well. Well, uh, you know, if you're going to deploy libraries, you have to redeploy the entire application, right? And so yeah, we do have. I mean, it's like it's like node modules or DLLs or almost in any language. Other, I would say the closest tech that's touched on this would be OSGI, where right. you don't have to restart or where you you don't you know you don't have to do like a process end as yep, part of your deployment. Engineered to be dynamic, exactly. And so um, OSGI, uh, uh, you know, it can be a difficult tech to work with when I, at least when I worked with it, uh, there were some difficulties, learning curve, that kind of thing. Um, so for whatever reason, I don't know, um, uh, just that no one thought of it or, or uh, it wasn't worth, it wasn't worth it in the end. Um, uh, no one's, no one's really used those hot deployment, you know, um, hot swap techniques. So it's a great technology, but it's too expensive to actually implement or too complex that it makes the ability to hot swap your code less desirable than just restarting the server. Yeah, it's 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 too stable and it's it's too difficult to have, you know, cooperation between, you know, a large uh, complex, you know, um, project, a lot of team members, a lot of different teams doing a lot of different things. Uh, you're almost certain to step on each other. But with with module federation, uh, it's just so simple, right? Uh, the way that it's been designed, it's it's just the to use module federation. Uh, for example, there's a video out there with pair programming. You and uh, someone else, uh, you know, it just took like uh, five minutes, right? Um, to 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 stand up your first federated app, right? It's just a s- simple set of configurations. So given that, it's like twenty uh, lines of code, roughly, yeah, to it, federate an app. <laughs> It's dead simple, and that's what you need to be to make to use the technology effectively, right? So that so that everyone can use it. <clears throat> and what Microlive does is um, it it puts it takes that technology and it puts it in a framework um, which is uh, of a hexagonal architecture, where um, uh, so one of the things that happens or one of the benefits of microservices is that you have you know strong boundaries between the components. Because the network's, you know, uh, uh, is a pretty strong boundary, right? Everyone has to write their own API, um, and and you can't you can't get away with just fudging something, um, like you can if you've got libraries talking to each other. You could just, you know, <clears throat> not observe the the formalism, you know, of the of the interface, right? If you so chose. It doesn't so, have to be so strict. You could have adapters on top of it, so the you know the inputs and outputs could vary in in all sorts of ways. Yeah, that- you can- you can get like an interpret, you know, the interpretations can go wild. And before you know it, you've got dependencies, you know, both ways. One of the other cool benefits is you can do more with unserializable stuff. Like on the network, I can't pass a function and say, here's do this, or here's the current context inside a symbol. But under federation, you could pretty much just pass it a symbol that's been you know, custom created or pass it context or the callback be a function 
that's Very, still all abstracted out but you you're extending you have all the benefits of like a restful microservice if you wanted it except we bolt it onto or it's what is one of the hexagons or that's the core concept behind hexagonal architecture if i understand it correctly uh yeah so so the core concept is that um the 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 domain logic right the business logic the core the application core logic uh that, that remains so here's here's like a typical you know hexagonal um uh architecture right where you're you're seeing uh <clears throat> the primary or driving adapters on the left hand side those are those are initiating client requests right to um, input data into the system right um, so you've got your you've got your public API, you've got your event backbone that's producing events, and uh, uh, and you've got an adapter that's consuming them. You've got controllers, uh, you know, for for your graph QL API or REST API, uh, and then on the other side, you know, you've got um, you're writing to a database or some kind of storage, <clears throat> and then we are introducing we're here we're introducing um, federated ports and adapters, right? So all these things are ports. Um, the ports are uh, on the domain, right? They're, they're, the, the domain logic is advertising its capabilities, right? And the application layer surrounding it uh, is where you have adapters that um, allow uh, data in or out, but always through these durable interfaces, uh, the ports, so that the, the domain logic remains uh, pristine. And you, you don't have to change it because you're changing environments or because you're changing a third party library or changing external service. Um, the core logic remains untouched for that reason, right? Only if you're adding like new features, would you touch it uh, or correcting some bugs, you know, <clears throat> typical stuff. So when you talk about ports here, it, are you talking about like the ports as in we register a bunch of service endpoints or what's a port in hexagonal? It's just an interface. Like you think interface. Yeah. So it's still on the same process. It's just a, it's just a like a gateway almost, or like a logic gate of some sort. Yep, form. just an interface. Um, okay. And so what you can do is you can enforce this. You can enforce this architecture so that you retain uh, your main your boundaries between components remain well defined uh, and and useful, and uh, and uh, you can automate uh, or or um, you know, generate code so that a lot of these tasks of integrating ports, binding ports to adapters, um, uh, binding to adapters to services, all these things can be automated for you. Um, and, and module federation helps us do that, right? So uh, what what uh, what uh, Aegis does is it allows you to define all the ports, right? And define the adapters, the services, um, circuit breakers, uh, all the things that you would expect to find uh, on, on any interface, right? And that are, that are common to find in microservices architecture. Uh, and that, that can all be, uh, you know, done on the fly, right? You can define new ports, uh, bind them to adapters dynamically, uh, bind them to new services automatically. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the magic of, of federation. Uh, none of that code, none of that code has to exist on the host. Yeah, that's yeah, that's brilliant. That's basically like code streaming at its prime. Code streaming used for more than, uh, you know, like one like everything that I've spoken about to do with code streaming is like let me stream this React component so that it's here for the render or something like that. But this is applying federation and code streaming to a completely different you know, aspect of software design, which is, you know, proper back end, like process layer architecture, not like, you know, the mid tier or something like that. But this thing can talk to your databases directly, but it can also act as a mid tier if, it, if you needed it to. It's just very versatile where this can sit and what kind of workload. Exactly. So here's, here's an example um, of uh, a port configuration. Okay, so you've got your ports here, listen, notify, save, find, uh, this is a, this is an order service. So validate address, uh, authorize payment, pick order, ship order, track shipment. All these all these are ports defined ahead of time, right? <clears throat> and the service will will generate these ports, right? 
and you know inbound ports uh inbound uh you know ports the adapter is going to call the port outbound the port's going to call the adapter um so you can you can bind you can say this is the, the service i want is it inbound or outbound there's a callback that gets called when data arrives on the port uh you have a timeout undo so you have compensating logic uh in the event you have to roll back a series of transactions um the system will remember the order in which the, the ports were called and simply um run them in reverse order and you've got a circuit breaker uh so that you don't wind up overwhelming uh, some other part of the system that's not behaving correctly um so all the things that typically you'd have to do for an integration you know these these things are all here and defined for you uh, and you can do these you can you know do these very quickly and really they're all attached to an object that we, that we could we would call uh, a domain model right the, uh, the model object so this is an order and um, if you use domain driven design for example right to to analyze okay what are the different uh, events within this business what are the what happens in this business you know i don't think that order services dramatically differ really everybody kind of gets it relatively the same so <clears throat> this is just this is just combining uh, the domain object the adapters and the ports so that they can all be defined together and that they're all interchangeable so for example here's a data source um so yeah i'm very interested in this data source i see you have the base class being data source mongodb so what happens if it's the base class? Do subclasses or superclasses get well? So, from that? so every every service, right? Every um, every model, right? Um, it defines its own data source. So that's critical uh, within microservices. Uh, the service must be the owner of the data, right? And how you get into trouble real quick is by uh, sharing a database, and then suddenly people are building a, you know, they're they're connecting, uh, they're integrating via database. They're they're using your data in ways you have no idea, right? Um, you simply have to hide. You simply have to hide data. Uh, so that's, it's similar to like uh, analytics, for example, doing uh, uh, having uh, analytics read off of say your Redux store raw, or right. analytics depend on a class name to get the title of something, or you know stuff you know things like that. It's the same kind of issue that that you have when. You're too intrinsically dependent on something yeah, so the, that the, isn't the important. internal representation of data absolutely has to be hidden. Uh, the only way to talk uh, from uh, service to service is through API, right? Whether that be an event or an HTTP call, whatever. Um, so here, what you have is uh, we're actually defining uh, each uh, each each service can use the default data source adapter for uh, the server. Um, uh, so the server can define a default persistence. It could be a file system. It could just be memory. Uh, it could be whatever. Um, and then each individual service or, uh, or domain object can define its own uh, uh, data store. So this guy's going to use Mongo. That guy's going to use this, that, and the other, right? And the and the microlib, uh, uh, the Aegis um, uh, data source factory will manage all those adapters. Um, in a uh, common cache and so everybody gets everybody everybody gets their own data and through the through the factory we get to federate the data actually like you find in graphql so we can um so we can not only federate the data but we can federate the the objects themselves so i can the actual run yeah, but, yeah not just the serialized output but we're we're yeah we're pulling it onto our process and computing it ourselves and continue to compute it on our own yes absolutely and when we're doing that we're going through inbound ports that have been defined uh on the object and when we're when we're calling out to let's say from an order service to a shipping service to place an order right um to get a label uh you know we're calling we're calling and the port is calling an adapter right and that adapter is, is has some um, client service client client library on the end of it that's talking to whatever right um so i've got a i've got a question for you you've spoken about microlib and you've spoken about aegis what's the difference between the two because i've seen aegis is aegis is new we've just released it 
And there's might be some who are wondering, you know, what's Aegis and how does it, what does it have to do with microlobe? Well, uh, they're they're pretty they're pretty similar, uh, but Aegis is is basically uh, the has been abstracted away so that um, you can you can build a server an Aegis server just like you would an Express server, right? So you're pulling in uh, only what you need from NPM, and uh, you know you're not installing some kind of piece of software, right? Um, it's it's all yeah, <coughs> coming from copying. It's like all this hard work is abstracted away and microlib is more of like a template of here's a little server here's like a basic server and it imports you know all the hard stuff from the aegis live like aegis npm package and you know here's you know two files to get you started or something yeah, like that exactly um like similar to what you find with the uh, you know react um yeah yeah or like a react example it's like a aegis example or in this case, like microlib, which is kind of the boilerplate. So, all right, let's see microlib in action. What would you say are some of the top killer features that separate microlib from, you know, the traditional way of doing things? Because there's probably going to be some people out there who are like, code over the network and code streaming and a couple concepts like that. From an operational standpoint, it sounds like it could bring down costs a lot. But what what's the what what are the main things you see in Aegis that other people should take interest in or take note? Right. Of? Well, um, you know, there's kind of two aspects to this, like maybe what the CTO might say, and uh, and then well, um, you know, friendliness to the developer, which is why, which is one of the advantages of having an open source, right? Um, you get it out there and then hopefully, um, you know, combining with, uh, you know, um, with the module federation, I mean, that was kind of a no brainer as soon as uh, we got in contact. Right. Uh, but, you know, Webpack has a great name and it's everywhere. Um, and so, uh, we just want this thing to work. Right. But, <clears throat> uh, from a business standpoint, yeah, similar to module federation, you want the, it just works. It, absolutely. Um, and you know what? It, 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 it has been how it's been going so far. Uh, I don't know if you've, uh, I think you've experienced this. You know. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's actually true. When I first pulled this down and booted it up, like my, the hardest problem I had was installing backend stuff that I don't have, like installing Mongo or installing Kafka if I needed it, or like, you know, all the other things a front end developer doesn't just have laying around usually. Right. But once I had like my brew stuff installed, it just stood up and ran. Yeah, and module federation in particular, right? In general, I should say, just uh, yeah. uh, it naturally uh, just uh, um, uh, more and more uh, benefits, right? Uh, solutions, uh, um, things are things things that have always been pesky problems. Um, hey, how do you share code uh, in in a microservices architecture? Do you share nothing? Do you share you know everything? You know, do you have to have a mono repo? Well, uh, what you do is module federation. And uh, so, yeah, um, so I would say that the, you know, from a business standpoint, right, clearly the, the advantage is um, um, that, uh, you know, people are out there, uh, the operational complexity, the, 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 the failed projects, right, the, um, the the you know the uh, you know uh, desiring to have the deployment independence and the the flexibility that that lends you right uh, you know the speed and agility that that gives you the freedom that gives you um, you know coming at such a price because of the because of the network right because of distri distribution uh, if you can if you yeah, can get, if you can eliminate that trade off that is that is a lot of money that is a lot of money uh, yeah, if I think like in CI, and I think like part of distribution and orchestration, CI is often the go-to thing that tries to say stitch something together, or you know Frankenstein the beast into you know the beast. <laughs> but how long does that take, and how repetitive? I mean, every major company has spent millions building their CI pipeline that does more or less the same kind of thing, just to less levels of you know perfection because it's built on you know 
a tool chain which effectively doesn't have any understanding of what it's processing. It's taking assets and moving them, but it can't read the runtime of that asset. It's you yeah. Know, whereas whereas this is baked in, <laughs> this this uh, we we have the runtime. We are the runtime, right? So uh, it's uh, module federation. Uh, you know, federation in general, it's it's just it's always better than copying data around. Um, uh, so so I mean, when you when you're able to when you're able to eliminate uh, one of the worst you know aspects of microservices. And you preserve the the main goal, right? Which is deployment independence. I think that's a win for everybody, right? Um, now there's some downsides. Like we, this is not plot polyglot, right? Not yet, anyway. Uh, we uh, probably need. Wasm technology and the fact that module federation works on Wasm modules, you could very well support distributed polyglot architecture. Possibly, yes. Right. Yep. So that's but, very I mean, interesting. Think about this in general, that in Node doesn't exist really today as I know it. Like we have a little bit of poly polyglot, but there's no framework that's like built to consume a C adapter that I've heard of. That's a Node.js library. So I think this is a new area that this opens up that maybe hasn't really been tapped or has been tapped, but has been limited by, again, this deployment box where everything sits in a box and you're kind of stuck in there. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, you know, another another feature that um, I'm going to try to be demoing soon here is, you know, um, uh, when you when you look at service environments, uh, serverless is great. It's it's the logical uh, extension of uh, virtualization, right? Uh, of cloud, of uh, pay as you go. Um, it's a logical conclusion. Uh, but what you find with serverless is a lot of vendor lock-in because um, basically you have to uh, write your code around <clears throat> the, the platform, uh, the vendor's framework. Uh, and you see companies out there like serverless, um, you know, kind of writing layers of abstraction to uh, get a workaround. Yeah, um, kind of standardized. Yeah. So, so this, this by this by not by virtue of trying to be a serverless platform, um, it, it essentially is an abstraction on top that would allow developers to not even know what cloud their code is being deployed to. Uh, because of how uh, federated deployment works, um, it's, it's once you install um, the, the Aegis server component uh, on a Lambda, for, let's say, that is the last time that you would use, let's say, AWS code deploy to deploy any code. Uh, everything else would be federated from that point on. And what that that's just staggering it's like it's like an extra layer of federation built into it um which is crazy to think it's like the, it takes over like the serverless type angle so it'll just connect to the infrastructure and takes over a lot of the ci cost as well yeah. like you're, what the ci in each pipeline might look like a call like a like hitting a web yep any any deployment any you know, deployment in your in your you know in your in your in your tool chain uh, that's that's gone that's all handled by federation now because you're not copying data and installing files that's just not happening anymore right uh, it's it's clunky it's clunky yeah. it's slow it's uh, um, you know we all know yeah no yeah, it's very clunky to to deal with especially as it get you scale you can find out that it slows down a lot or that your webpack builds just get slower and slower over time and that's i guess another nice thing of federation is now you can build these really large complex back-end mo monoliths that needs you know state persistence or something like that but you don't get locked into waiting for this you know 40 minute build to finish or however long some of these huge backend systems take, you're building and deploying, you know, a 30 second piece of runtime, and you have multiple teams doing that. And so at will, at will, right? Uh, whenever, whenever is yeah. needed, you know. And there's there's zero downtime involved with that, right? Um, so how is it that zero downtime? Like I've I've kind of tweeted about this once or twice that the that Aegis has the ability to hot reload code. Um, and we've kind of alluded to it through OSG, like, you know, saying, you know, there's similar patterns to OSGI here, but it's a lot easier. So how is there zero downtime? So uh, with MicroLab, it's designed where all the modules 
uh, or all the models are serializable, right? Um, so we can we can put that data anywhere, um, you know. And there's an in-memory cache. Uh, so uh, basically, whenever there's a request, uh, you know, new code that uh, that, we're, that we're being requested to load, and we go and grab that new code, um, we, we can just restart the yep. runtime um, with with zero interruption to the server itself. Uh, so connections, you know, client connections can sit there and remain and keep processing, uh, while internally we um, um, we reload the runtime. So the process never dies. Process. Or the process doesn't have to yeah, die. Yeah, process doesn't die. The process the doesn't die. We just we just clean up memory. That's very fascinating. So that so. So I can hot reload a Lambda if I wanted to. If I had like the eventing and I was able to communicate an event to the Lambdas, I could say, hey, Lambda, stay warm, and here's new code. Yep. And on the next test that Lambda, it's going to execute new code in a boat without having to cold start itself, like you do usually when you say, hey, Lambda, serve from this S3 object now or from this CloudFront bucket or whatever. Yes, absolutely. It, all it does is expire the Lambda and start another Lambda pointed at an that new bucket uh, that. effectively you know if you've got everything timed right and all your curl scripts and everything you know you don't have to a cold uh there's no cold restart ever again right in theory yeah if you had something to keep your lambdas warm you would never have to cold start like core regions even if new code was deployed that's right which is really cool um so yeah let's uh let's and the cold restart uh, the love... cold start should be much faster too Right. Um, okay. So yeah, let's let's uh, let's do. That's actually true. The cold start will be quicker because it's not uh, immediately parsing all of the mm -hmm. runtime up front. So there's kind of a separation in execution and and download. Kind of the same benefit you get in the browser. That's right. And speeds up the render because the CPU is dedicated to one set of ta of tasks of parsing and creating modules and then ticks over to executing that. All right, so um, these are just a couple of test apps that come um, uh, uh, with Aegis, right? So for one of the you know functions is when you define uh, your service, right? The idea here is that you know you're you're defining what would have otherwise been you know a standalone microservice, okay? Um, and now these things are going to live together. You know, um, in in whatever way that you think is cohesive, right? Um, so certain services you you probably co-locate, right? Uh, and others maybe not. Um, the, the, it's completely composable. Um, but what what happens is um, uh, you you um, advertise that that uh, model and its adapters and services uh, 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 service adapters and um, the Aegis host will um, uh, import those remote modules, right? And it will generate uh, dynamically, um, uh, you know, set of like CRUD APIs, right? Uh, right now it's just, just REST, uh, but it'll do that on the fly. Um, so I'll do a demo of that, um, uh, creating a new one and show basically how fast that goes. So yeah, there's a lot of API libraries out there like Loopback and that kind of thing. And those are those are fantastic, right? But um, uh, nothing that's nothing that's that um, uh, that that allows for independent deployment, um, and that's the really the key. Uh, yeah, there's no nothing that really looks at or like an orchestra like there's Kubernetes, but that's still not that's orchestrating images of deployed code. It's not orchestrating code like the deployment of the code. It's still based on like a, an older paradigm, I suppose. So there's not many places that are targeting this problem. Oh no, I mean this is this is new. This is new territory, right? Um, uh, and uh, that's that's kind of the excitement about it uh, with it from from my angle. Uh, but it's it's just it's just great that it's uh, you know um, really solves this really intractable problem uh, and. Um, and I don't, uh, you know, I don't see, uh, I don't see this, you know, stopping anytime soon. There's, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of 
add-on effects, right? And there's a lot of uh, different ideas, uh, different opportunities this unlocks. All right, so, um, yep. So, so here I am, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the developer of the order service, okay? Uh, or I'm developing a, a, you know, I'm a service developer uh, and I'm going to, um, I'm going to create a new service, okay? Uh, and for and for the sake of speed, um, oh, I should I didn't have this set up. Well, how about I'm going to retire? So no, no let's, a, let's just call this. Catalog. Create a new service yeah. called Catalog. Yeah. I'm not going to bother with uh, the internal of this uh, catalog. This is catalogs. Okay. And then I'm going to expose this out, export this. And I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to recompile, rebuild this. So basically simulate a redeploy. Yeah. So this is, so this is, this is, me, uh, exactly. this is me like redeploying the code. Uh, or this is me just this is just uh, um, uh, rebuilding with this new object, compiling it for the first time. OK, run clean and OK. Yeah, I didn't kill the old process. So let's start that guy up and let's head over to catalogs right there. Nothing that that thing never came down. This is the uh, can I post to it? Okay, right. So um, you can see that uh, you know a new. Uh, I, I could I could stop and start the server, and I would have this would be persisted, right? Uh, uh, there's a new there's a new um, uh, database that was created um, for this, uh, or if maybe I have it actually on file. So I think it's just writing out to the file system. Um, I could change it to database. Just depending on whatever base adapter you integrate, yep. um, and uh, so so there's uh, there's a lot you can do here, right? So you know, in addition, you may have defined uh, you know uh, an orchestration flow, right, where you involve catalog. Uh, and now, so hold on, just just to rewind, because I think some people might have missed. Did the application just hot reload itself? Yeah. Okay, so back up a little bit and let's explain what we were running restart on because that's the remote and restart is basically webpack build and then like a curl command to that to a hot reload endpoint or so how did it within, within the within your CI CD pipeline, right? When you do a commit and you do a build, you're going to you're going to um, uh, communicate with the host. You're going to notify the host some way. Uh, it doesn't really matter. In this case, I think it was just an HTTP call um, to tell it, "Hey, reload yourself," because uh, there's there's new software out here. Okay, let's go show us uh, your hot reload script in NPM. I think that'll help it tie together for people so that, because I think restart's like a short shortcut command that includes build and oh, hot Oh yeah, reload. that was the, the, re, the restart was just, uh, it does a build and then a start of the app. Uh, and on, start, on the start of the app, did it notify the host that it needed to hot reload itself? Yes. Okay, so now let's say the app is running 
and I want to change something on it. Like let's change, uh, let's add an object to order, or let's change database sources. In in this uh, build, in in a uh, where you have hot reload, and I want to read what the code is that you execute for hot reload. Scripts, hot mm -hmm. reload. And it's literally, you just hit curl microlib reload, and it hot reloads microlib, which is yeah. the host. That's and the host. it uses this outer depends on inner architecture. So when we restart this, we basically throw away this closure, but persist any data from it, open up a new closure, or essentially restart Webpack, which then goes out and refetches all the chunks. And that restart time is... So if we keep the if you kept lambdas warm, and you would avoid a thousand millisecond cold start, which means that a hot reload event would only take you say two hundred milliseconds, depending on your HTTP source. If you had it, yeah, like depending on how much, yeah, you know, depending on and, how much you're taking in cache, and depending, uh, yeah, on what uh, CPU you have and how much memory, um, but it's significantly shorter. Yeah, significantly yeah. shorter. You're not downloading files and uh, and writing files out to disk and uh, you know and restarting all kinds of processes. This is this is super fast, right? It's just one message to the host, which then you know internally yeah, which then just disposes of a closure and re restarts Webpack. So all you're doing is paying for the Webpack boot time. You're not paying for the cold start boot time. You're just paying to restart Webpack. Yeah, which and, is and client connections will never go down, right? Client connections never go down. So uh, if you're doing single down. process, yeah, if you're doing single process in cluster, it, with cluster, we actually do a rolling restart, right? So how uh, is it in single process the client never goes down? Because that seems, or how, sh show us the hot reload code, or that might be an Aegis, that might be for another time, but um, it's just amazing that. Yeah, because I, I guess, yeah, the process is the client. So that's where the express server is running. And we just have a piece of middleware or a root to a piece of middleware that's microlibs or all of that. And we're saying all of that stays active. The only thing that we're going to do is we're just going to restart the start function of this thing and bust the cache on it. And whenever we get this update, deal with yes. some management and then just re-require this file yeah and, and the re-require is made uh, simple by the fact that we're, we're we're requiring our own remotes within uh, the host which is uh, something that the uh, module federation allows you to do basically that provides us with the with a nice closure right closure the um yeah it really makes it easy to dispose of everything that we need to and, and then the code streaming as well we're literally tell telling lambda hey go out over the network to your CDN or to your VPC or even to Redis if you want it, and read these files back down into memory and execute these modules. And just like a browser, pretty much, we're able to fetch them without having them there. And we don't need to kill the process because we don't have to update the file system. That's right. Yeah, we're not interested in the file system. <laughs> the network's the file system, right? Um, you know, GitHub. <laughs> initial file system and in this case we're using just straight from github like we're just pulling code from a github like in Wherever. yep and but why not wait from github yeah 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 oh. you could host it right on github and you know if you wanted secure well i guess security would be it's more about exposing source but there's so many ways where you could well you got github enterprise you know yeah. um, or whatever are you using aws's uh code source, whatever, right? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever your pleasure. Um, but yeah, the, I think showing this with GitHub, um, it's a, and, it's like the free way to, to show it off where you have need this minimal infrastructure and literally having your hosting platform that your server reads from be your own GitHub repo. That's pretty cool kind of concept where like, it, you know, the remotes are fetched where it's like, oh, we're all running one line of code. Without writing one line of code, um, raw .github content and just get it right from the repo, and that's what you're reading and running. Zero configuration, yeah. It's just it just works. Um, 
yeah, that's, that is pretty exciting, you know, and, um, you know, I think you asked to see a uh, live replacement of a, uh, of a storage adapter. Yeah. yeah. So, that, that's uh, pretty slick too. Uh, Tyson had shown me before and like, I wanted to like let the audience see this because the hot reload is so subtle that you don't even like you wouldn't have noticed really that it happened. We hit restart and what we didn't we didn't restart microlib. We rebuilt microlib example, which is where all of our logic is. Microlib is like what is running Aegis and all of that. And the example is just a module that connects onto it. So re it's microlib example never runs really does it or it, the only thing that it runs is it runs like a network server for itself so that it you just can just reach out and read it you know off local it's, so it's acting using the file server basically yeah uh, and it's also it's also hosting my other you know test services right but it is it, it is as far as being remote it's 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 more than what it needs to be right um yeah I, i'm yeah, I'm just using it for our, for our, as a kind of a, a testing platform, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like a sophisticated example, but yeah, it's really cool to just understand that microlib example never runs. So when we go re reload or restart, all we're doing is telling this thing, "Hey, ping ping Aegis and let it know that I built new code and Aegis hot reloads." Yep. And, 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 and again, in reality, what, what would happen is, you know, you'd go and you'd commit that code, right? And at that yeah. point, the, the CICD um, pipeline would take over. Yeah. That would be what would, you know, uh, be responsible for the deployment. In this case, it's just uh, uh, for, for sake in this of example. Case we're, just, we're simulating the build and the ping command. But yeah, I get what you mean. Um, but yeah, like, so I think showing... So with that in mind, now we're going to swap out a database driver and we're going to say without turning off the server or the host, we're going to replace the remote's database. And we're going to tell this order service that we have running of this order system, we're going to go from, I think it was Mongo, and we're going to go to the file system store or one way or the other. But yeah, basically, right. yep. That's right. We're going to completely change and require a different file system um, oh, I killed by it. editing the files themselves, not by using a switch statement or sending a function that points it there, but by actually going in and just changing the text of what we're going to use, saving the code and redeploying it. Absolutely. The host will pick it up. Yep. Uh, all right. So. Now let's just let's just check out orders and see what's in there. Okay. Um, so there's there's twelve hundred orders, um, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> I, can, I can tell you that that's 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 Mongo that's backing that right now. Um, uh, but let's go change that. Yeah. So we're going to replace the database, and. If we hit the Mongo store, which is, I think is the one we have connected at the moment. Yep. So well, let's hit that in the browser and see how many data sources or like how many, what what's the count that we currently have? Yep. So let's look at order. Yeah, so order right now has this, this data source, uh, which is Mongo uh -huh. defined for it. Uh, and if we look on the server, uh, just microlib. So this is the the host that E just runs on. Yep. Uh, if we look here, I think what we have defined is the uh, uh, file. So that's just using the file system by default. If you don't specify anything, you will just use file system by default. So, um, and I think I have it just going to dist so that it gets cleaned up when you rebuild. Um, so yeah, you can see the uh, products is out there. Yeah, um, well, we just and we just created product. Uh, or we created catalog. Yeah, but it had product on the uh, as the name. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> so uh, so let's so we but that's all we've got out there right now. So let's go uh, to to um, back to example. 
So let's see. query it and let's see what's in the Mongo store before we right change. Uh, so or we're just restarting. Right. Okay. So yeah. so let's, yeah, let's just clear this and let's just see what's um. Oh, I just created one. Um, let's see what's in orders right now. All right. 1,276 so, orders are Mongo database. Right. And All right. Now we are. All right. And then, yeah, this is microlib. So you want to go over to the, there we go. Microlib. I'm just going to comment this out, right? So now we've turned off the data source and now we're going to go start all. So what does start all do? Uh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do a restart, which is just going to, um, uh, so I'm going to just kill the app here. Okay. Uh, not, that doesn't really matter. Uh, what, what, what I'm doing, yeah, like, what all we're all doing in reality, I would, I would rebuild and retest, right. And then commit this code, right. And then I would yeah. go through the CI CD process. And it, when it's time to deploy, it would, it would notify um, the, the remote, the remote uh, to- and so to, we're just gonna, okay. So we just build, yeah. build and notify the, the host. That's right. Okay. So it's building and now, now it's up. And uh, you can see right here, hot reload complete. That was a note that it, uh, that was a message it got from the host. Hot reload complete. Okay, so just by bringing it up, it completed its hot reload. Yep. All right, and well, let's go. Uh, let's go query this thing. And uh, oh, none in there. Wow. So how many do I have now? One order. One. <laughs> yeah, total one. Yep. So to recap, uh, here. what we did was build these files, then so go yarn serve that disk file of the microlib example and send off a curl request that says hot reload to where microlib is running, which is powered by Aegis. And that's where the hot reload happens because that's the process everything is running through. And this is using basically like polylith architecture because the idea is that this runs on a lambda. So each lambda could technically run as the monolith, but it's distributed across multiple applications or multiple. Yeah, or or like uh, you might say it like, uh, you know, it's it's a mono. You, you go back to the monolith because you're consolidating, but the monolith is really made up of multiple um uh, uh you know components which are the which are the microservices which are the application components except now they're truly modular and independently deployable um yeah you didn't have before and so you can see here here's the order now that's being written out of the file system instead of the mongo that so is you, very you, cool so you could do this uh you could you could do this like you just flush uh, you know, the, this is like how you migrate your data if you wanted. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can send this stuff anywhere around, like to the to edge network or something, where uh, you know um, you have more traffic. So it's it's really flexible that way. Uh, everything's lightweight um, and keeping it serializable. That's um, that's the key. <clears throat> so so um, yeah, I think it's a lot easier to keep it serializable since we are busing, we're able to bus functions along with the data objects. So we can have like methods that this thing can carry around thanks to module federation. We can basically federate the data oh, object yeah. as well as functions. Yep. Which is a That's very right. interesting way of sharing stuff that I don't think really has dawned on anybody. Using module federation is almost a data bus as well for, you know, shipping around the serializable part as well as the things that might mutate whatever your base, you know, component might be or whatever methods to get picked up along the way. Like user, you could have the serialized data for user plus actions that could happen. But the only thing that you persist is the kind of state of it. Yep, that's it. It's a very, very cool mix. So it's um, it's uh, um, 
it's it's really powerful. Um, and then it's it's there's a lot of other um, you know aspects to be explored, right? And a lot of other benefits that uh, that I see for it. Um, but I think what what of, what is of interest is is um, the immediate I think crunch that some people are feeling um, in cloud native app design, right? That microservices they want them but they're too hard. Um, and I think that this is this is the logical solution to that problem, right? Um, so you can get rid of your Death Star, just uh, call up, put everything on one process, right? Uh, you know, um, you know, have some, uh, obviously exercise some um, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, thought with, with how you co-locate and, you know, how many services and, um, you know, you, you still, you still have to you know, think along those lines, right? Um, uh, but uh, things things have gotten easier for you. You can you can maintain, you know, um, the autonomy of your teams, right? Um, but now you're together on this framework. Well, okay, um, with the, with the framework, really, uh, it, it, there's an interface that has like three required fields, I think, uh, and then there's a million options, and that's that's that model specification object that I showed you. There's really only three fields required. There's a factory function to generate your object, uh, a name for it, um, and then I think an endpoint name, which is like the plural that we put in out in REST. And that's it. Everything else is just optional. Um, so yeah, you can use as much as or, or as little of the framework as you want, right? But you have the whole time you have module federation, you know, just right there, um, ready to go. Power. A lot of it. That's that's very cool. And you, yeah, yeah. That's um, it's a very cool setup. Um, this is great. Uh, this is, I'm super excited to see this mature and also like, you know, thinking about the future of integrating this with Medusa. Yeah, this is uh, just a, yeah, exactly. This is just a kind of a teaser, right? Like we'll, uh, yeah. we'll, kind of, uh, we'll kind of have, uh, uh, something that's maybe a little bit, um, you know, a little bit more flashy, uh, pretty soon, I think. Right. Yeah. Hopefully. And I mean, like, I think we also need to, we need to build like a hello world micro live example, or we need to make like Aegis examples and then be like, you know, simple or advanced, like order one and make a few examples to help kick the user base off to like, how do we implement something simple? So right. still need to work out a couple things, put out a couple articles, but this is really just a sneak peek at, you know, what's next that we're excited about that we've recently open sourced and, you know, that we feel is going to have an impact on the federated, you know, framework space. Indeed. Yeah. Oh, great. thanks. This is great. Well, yep. This Always was a great. Great, great to chat. And um, thanks for all the hard work. You know, you really were the kind of brain child behind. Um, yeah. It's, it's, and it's so unfortunate uh, how we, how we, you know, hooked up with just uh um, you know, because we we're looking kind of for the same solution, right? And um, um, yeah, this is this is great. This is great. Yeah, this really uh, just came together nicely, and that's uh, it's awesome to see an open source. <laughs> so it's super super awesome to see you know this kind of tech and innovation starting to happen. Um, and yeah, I think we will have a pretty bright future of module federation. We see more technology like this start to become commonplace on the marketplaces. Absolutely. All right, so, cool. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to just keep an eye on time here. Um, and we'll probably bring out a part two or more demos of this. Or Tyson, I know you're working on some exciting content. So I don't know if you want to end off with uh, any last plugs, um, things people should Google or sure. read, or what, you, what you've got in the works. Yeah, so I'm probably going to put out another article, right, that... Um, Basically brings uh, there's there's an article I put out last year at the end of the year uh, that kind of talks about these ideas right and um, alludes to uh, um, what we've done here right and then uh, so I'm going to put out another one that that basically talks about what's been done and what's left to be done and you know what we see happening and then uh, you know some more demo content right um, some more videos yeah. I think on on YouTube um, but yeah, probably an you know, article on Medium. Um, I think that'll be soon. So cool. 
for that. Well, yeah, well, I'm sure there will definitely be people excited to read that uh, and see more about this. I know I definitely am. So thank you for your time and thank you for your hard work. And, you know, we'll catch up again sometime soon. All right, Zach. Yep. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.